How many of you working in banking industry? Ah, I'm happy that not only us suffer. <laughs> Little bit about me. That's Saxo Bank building, a very, very beautiful building. Um, lying a little bit outside of Copenhagen. I live in a beautiful little country called Denmark. It was ranked as the happiest country in the world where kids get lollipops and parents get to have a special license number plate from the cars, so it's pretty nice. While I'm not working at Saxo, I contribute to community building. As Tim mentioned, um, I organized Cloud Native Copenhagen meetups um, when last year, I think, when KCD started getting big, we also started doing KCD Denmark, the Kubernetes Community Days Denmark. And we were able to raise 40,000 US dollars to a charity institution called the Coding Pirates, who are supporting small kids learning IT. So a bit about Saxo Bank. Saxo Bank is an online investment bank, originally founded in 1992. And from 2001, we obtained its banking license. It was renamed to Saxo Bank. Every day, we have 16 billion USD worth of trades going through our platform. And worldwide, we have more than 200 partners and more than 1.2 million clients. This number needs an update because our first half number just came out. So we have over 816 billion client assets with us. So we are not a small player in the market. Today we're talking about trust in FinTech. So how do we quantify trust? It seems a little bit fluffy when you think about trust. Can we measure it? How can we calculate it? There's actually someone did this formula, try to calculate trust. I have, I have a Master of Science degree in computer in, in um, software development. Uh, I had a discrete math and uh, algorithm design. And this is daunting to me. I don't know how many of you can make sense out of it. But the professor, or the former professor of uh, Oslo University, Mark Burgess, who is the one who came up with the formula, um, from his article in Trust and Trustability, he argued that uh, Trust is as a prediction about someone's behavior based on their past action, intentions, and the reliability. So let's say, let me give you an example of, of my own. So my mom makes fantastic breakfast. When I'm going home to visit her, she always makes a lot of small dishes to go with the porridge. So when I wake up in the morning, I can trust nice, very nice breakfast waiting for me. In the other hand, if I have a project, my team work really hard for the past three, four weeks, and I need someone to release it to production. Despite I trust my mom, I will never let her touch my laptop, <laughs> let alone of releasing new software. So when we talk about trust, it's you trust someone, a particular person, to certain things. So you don't just mix match them. It is a very, very specific area, specific area, specific domain you trust somebody with. So now I would like to ask you to join me to set up this, uh, to answer two questions, just two questions about your, your trust towards to your institution, financial institution. So if I... Exit here. Thank you. I'll bring up the screenshot here. So how much do you trust your financial institution with your data? I 
I'm kind of happy to see the completely distrust the stack. It is slightly smaller. Think about where do you, where do you store your cash <laughs> if you don't trust your financial institution. Thank you very much. So let's on to the second question. Just to stay in the, in the same place. Now, it, it's a little bit longer, but it's, it, there's a lot of content to it. Thinking of in the future of banking, which of the following would you be invested in using if your financial institu institution offered it? It's in the same place, yeah. Wow. I don't know if you have noticed that, uh, okay, this is not very good at this result because you can't read, read everything, but I hope you can read it from your phone that uh, the, the, top, uh, the top features on these offerings you have clicked, it's actually not the financial guidance which your financial institution is supposed to offer you, but you care more about your identity credit protection. And this is exactly the same as how we see in US when they did this survey. <clears throat> so you see, that you're not alone in not trusting your financial institution. Also, you are not alone when you desire to have your data protected. And that's also what we do at Saxo. We prioritize security even more than our application, the certain service we are offering. If it's not secure, let alone of going market, going to the market because it could cause more damage, which will harm us with our credit. So from DevOps to DevSecOps, I, I saw some very good explanations say, what are the difference? And the explanation was, DevSecOps, there's no particular difference between DevOps and DevSecOps. It's just DevOps down right, that's DevSecOps. On the new fancier term, it's platform engineering. I like to think platform engineering is an extension of DevSecOps. It's more a systematic way to look at architect design offer your developer experience to help your developer deliver their business value faster, safer, and easier. So when we want to integrate security into the DevOps life cycle, the challenge we see is the ratio. There are way more developers compared to um, operations engineers, compared to secure, uh, security engineers in the market. And you could say, OK, is it that uh, a real issue? How many places do we actually need security? So if we break this whole circle, eight different um, actions, into three big buckets, where you build, you deploy, and you run. During the build time, you start with writing your own application. So you probably need to care about your code quality. How good is my code? Are there any bugs there? Um, do I have sufficient test cases to make sure my logic is sound? And for the external code you have included, you probably need to think about, uh, hey, can I use it in my commercial product? Maybe it's, a maybe it's a copy left licensed software that we I cannot include. Maybe there are vulnerabilities that I need to look after. When you finally get it deployed, you still care about everything because you don't want to deploy anything which is vulnerable into your environment. So you need to think about the integrity of your packages. 
you could, you could deploy something or you could think you are deploying the code you have written yesterday, but maybe it's not. Maybe someone has swapped it. Or you think you locked an external dependency. Now when you pull it again, with the exactly same version, it could be different logic you're running. As a financial institution, change process is important to us. We need to log who did what at what time, approved by whom. So when you get to the run time environment, maybe you don't think too much about your code quality anymore because now you're already in action, but you still need to care about the external dependencies. Maybe there's new vulnerability found. Maybe someone decided to change the license so they can afford the beautiful car they saw yesterday. You also need to think about the security aspects of it. Think about if there's any ports running in the production as ad, um, have the, the admin or run as root user has a high privilege access to certain paths it's not supposed to be. It could do more damage than just take its own application down. In the worst case, it could take an entire cluster down. <laughs> And of course, you keep monitoring. You need to make sure to pick up all the traces available out there. Like last talk, Liz mentioned that to use Tetragon to monitor part of behavior. Yeah, I want to mention this one because I think our developer really have a huge work to do in terms of learning and running application in nowadays. When they finally get an application there, and then when they need to debug applications, there are so many layers they need to go through to finally hit their own application. And some of those stacks they don't have control over with. It's deployed by a completely different team, let alone the entire CNCF ecosystem. This daunting picture, I don't know how many times it has been referenced in conferences, because it is really difficult to stay up to date, to navigate the, the very, very comprehensive uh, yet complex system. There's always a new service mesh you can evaluate. And if, like most of us, your company also runs Kubernetes cluster in the cloud. Most likely, you are also utilizing some of the managed service offered by those big cloud players. And each of them have so many managed services. So stay up to date, knowing what configuration you need to do for your S3 bucket, or for your BigQuery, or for Purview, or managed instance. All this managed service, if you want to be on top of it, or having expert team manage them, it's a very expensive and very, very time consuming thing to do. I think about the developers, <laughs> it's actually really difficult to be a developer. And this is the same thing when we saw four years ago when Stack, uh, Stack Overflow did a developer survey where 65,000 developers have answered the question, where 15% of them, they have reported they have mental issues. And 83 of them, they even, 83% uh, of, uh, of them have reported burnout. So we really need to focus on how to improve developers' working environment because they are the main force for us to be able to deliver new features to our customer. So if we go back to the DevSecOps, so, and all, some people say platform engineering. So why does all this matter? Like in the security, can we just skip them all? Do we just push all these features, new features to developers? At least in Saxo Bank, we believe in happy developers. They write good code, and they will deliver high quality services, and thus give us happy customers. So what we do, which later on, if you think <laughs> we can, you can do better, please find me afterwards and, and let me hear your ideas. What we do is we try to put them, put all the configurations into platform offering. So our developer doesn't need to think too much about them. So we give them those tools at the build time. We give them tools, for example, use SonarCube to check their code quality, check about their test coverage. Um, once everything's good, we will sign an image. 
um, in, and then push them into our private registry. Same for external dependencies. We have JFrog, we have Sysdic for scanning if there are any vulnerabilities. Again, once they are checked, everything is signed and pushed to our private registry. We also give um, Docker this base image and the base Helm char to developers, which is hardened and have all the security configuration in place to help them start at the easier place, where later on they don't need to get blocked by a certain policy engine. So at the deploy time, it's a lot easier. They just check in the new version and then see things run. Or they can also use pipeline to directly deploy when they have packaged their artifacts. At the runtime, we offer different options to, for developers to monitor their metrics, logs of an application. We have Sysdic to help check the, their port behavior. And same for Kivono, for giving security advice based on the requirement we have in the bank. And you probably also say, you put a lot of things up there. But we actually put the most things to the left side because we want you, we want to give developer very, very timely feedback. So they are, we are secure already from the get-go. It's also cheaper to fix issues, fix errors and bugs earlier in the process than if it's in production, and we'll get happier developers with that setup. We also focus on the right side, putting a lot of effort to monitor the environment. Because production is where the most attack happened. And even though the static analysis give you great insight, they don't give you pr complete insight. So many things, the behavior you first see when they are running in the production. And let's face it, not all production Run, uh, running ports, they are, they are properly scanned because they could be in break glass situation that you have to release something without it being run in your dev and test environment because you have to close a huge hole you have just found. <laughs> and finally, that's the place where you found a zero days vulnerability that you want to take action as fast as possible. But there's still a lot of things right, for developers to figure out. It's a huge toolbox from left to right. So that's small. Like everybody else, <laughs> we start putting a portal in front of our offering. So we try to template as many offerings as possible from developers when they start bootstrapping their, their repository. They already get on the security best practices building. They get the base image. They get the helm chart to gear up. It's there. Now they are ready to modify, add the business logic, and start delivering. We also have started another project last year that it, it used to, it, how do I best way to put it? Now many people talk about platform orchestrator. We, we do it more like a service orchestrator, that many things you can write, you can deploy, but they are something needs a little bit more, that's access. So your service might offer certain access. Your service also consumes that access. And those access provision is critical. And when you disaster recover, many people only think about the deployment, your application, your Kubernetes cluster. But there's also all the access you need, all the firewall opening outside of cluster. So that's what our service orchestrator is focusing on. But of course, that's a different talk. But doesn't mean we can celebrate with all we have. Of course not. There's always new things we need to learn and improve. So there are some recommendations I would like to leave to you. First of all, even that's new requirement, no matter if security or compliance, code it. If they come here, cannot, cannot quantify or write it down. That's not, um, that's not a good enforcement that you want to put on developers. Once you can write it down, you can code it, then you can enforce it. 
invest on your people, your, your developer, your platform engineer, upskilling them so they're comfortable with the change. Practice chaos engineering. You, you might be surprised when you randomly shut down your applications in the environment. There might be some undesired dependencies has been baked in by the newcomer or by someone, someone's oversight. And start small and iterate. Don't think about saying, hey, their, their company already have 100 policies. Let's also adopt all of them. You will create a huge burden to developers if they have to spend all their time just fixing something to be able to run on your platform. Help them one bit at a time, give them warnings, give them trainings, and so they have time to correct in the same time, able to deliver business value. Finally, automation, automation, automation. Template everything. Even within the, let's say you have a very good platform team, you can write a Kubernetes operator to, to orchestrate many of your internal services um, deployments. Even you don't have these very skilled ones because they are quite difficult to get. With just PowerShell and Bash, can get you very far. So try to, try to do that instead of manually executing a lot of tasks. Try to upskill them, automate, and have a systematic way of orchestrating the, the platform, if you would like to call it platform engineering instead of DevOps building. And the final thought is eyes on the price. I don't know how many times I have talked about developers in, in this conference, but I do think developers are super important. You want to give developers an essential toolkit which enables them to deliver business value, to focus on their domain knowledge, so they can, they can give this back to the company, serve the customer much faster, safer, easier. Not a new pipeline you could write or a new CNCF sandbox a project you just learned in last fancy Cube, uh, KubeCon or other conferences. But stay simple and then help a developer, then you can grow together. Thank you. As we wait for the questions, uh, I think one question I have. I love that we started off with security. Uh, both talks are security focused. I think um, a lot of developers usually don't uh, <laughs> don't enjoy the security team getting involved. So how's how's the uh, relationship there between the security team uh, and the developers at Saxo Bank? For I think we are facing similar challenge, probably like everyone else. It's, it's security. It should be closer to us than than it is than in the reality that they are they are a little bit distant in especially in the new container Kubernetes orchestration this world. Um, but we are getting closer and closer. We, we, what you could do like what we do and at the Saxo Bank, what you could also do is we involve them extremely early. So when we have ideas that hey, we don't want to use for example, Azure Keyword anymore. We want to experiment with a seal secret or something else. Write your, write your idea down, even with an, um, write your idea down, say this is how we implement it and how we add extra so it's more your company, not just standard something out of the box from open source. Because I would say 99% of the time you have some additional requirement than what's out there. So add that, um, and then add it one step further. So you think about developer experience and present to developer, uh, to security team. So they can get inspired, say, okay, this is how they think, how they approach. And they, they could come, it's easier for them to give feedback at that time. But if you just go there and say, hey, we are thinking about using CO secret. They probably say, well, first of all, I don't know what's CO secret. So I don't think I will be spending time on that. But then if you do the preparation, you actually give them a chance to help you. So they can say, hey, I think it's a very good idea. But think about it. We also have those legacy systems which might not support that or something else. Yeah, so definitely open communication between the teams is exactly. quite important. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so yeah, some questions are coming in. Uh, so the first one I'll highlight, do you encounter resistance within the organization when shifting left? How do you deal with that? 
Yeah, you got to make that shift very seamlessly because if you add, let's say, cystic scanning or JFrog scanning and you start block that from deployment from day one, everyone's going to hate you, let's face it. <laughs> so what you need to do probably start with a lot of trainings, just promote it. Like you try to sell someone something, feels like a, just pretend you're a salesman, sell an idea to them, say it's great. Why it's great even, even though they're giving you more work, but it's still great because you're secure, right? Otherwise, they're not gonna buy our stuff from us anymore if we are insecure, something like that. Sell, sell an idea and then bring them with you and then come with a slow, slow uh, rolling out process. So, so in the beginning, Maybe only when you have a critical vulnerability with a fix which has been out there. Or well, those ones you block and you do it with them. So you already scan the environment, you know when the, fix, when the issues are, give them the fix instruction, do it with them the first couple of iterations. And then gear up and then say, now actually, I'm not just normal criticality, right? The medium I'm gonna force on them because now they already know how to deal with the whole life cycle of management. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, have you have you or your team ever found a live exploit at the bank? Not sure. Can you even say that? <laughs> well, we can tell we have we do have a bounty program at Saxo Bank. So we have a, we have a had a, like a black hat um, which have successful exploit the bank. This we can say, but we do have bounty program and we have a reward them. So there are some problems there, but we actively work with the, the, the correct group and then say, yes, and this is us, go hack it. And then when you find something, come tell us. And thank you very much. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Allowing, uh, you know, encouraging trying to find vulnerabilities. So exactly. Fix them exactly. Quite. Because we want, we want to know it. So we, we are ahead of the bad ones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next question, uh, do you have a ded dedicated change management team? And if so, how do you involve them in cloud native technology and DevSecOps? We do have a change management team. And what we do is we, we keep them and then we, we invent another change management. <laughs> we have, let's, let's put it in this way, in order to not have a change management team in the new stack, we invent, we invent automation which replace them. That's what we do, but we keep them for on our legacy workload. So new ones, there's no change process. And the change process is on automatic check you see on the list, which checks the code quality, checks the vulnerability, check the compliance, license, all these. And then we stamped it with a, with a signing key. And once they are signed, they pushed out private registry. As long as you are there, you can release. And then of course, for eyes principle, that's it. So as you said before, you know, automate, automate, automate. Exactly, exactly. Don't deal with the people, it's difficult. <laughs> um, how do you deal with and enforce regulatory compliance requirements at Saxo Bank? Is everything automated? Do you have approval gates? I would like to say everything is automated, but it's, it's, it's in a new world. <laughs> so we still have legacy code that we do respect them. Not everything is automated. So therefore they have change. They have a cap and they call it this change approval board a couple of times a day. But in the new world, everything is automated because we have the checks baked into code. But for us, principle to production, you can't skip that. People with the knowledge need to acknowledge that new New things going out and this is also to protect uh, our platform because when the market opens suddenly our, the, or before the market opens we already uh, auto scale our ports out to make sure they can take the initial hit when everyone log into the platform you probably don't want to release at that time so therefore we do have a small soft checks here there to make sure that you, at least you need to have for ice principle that's the minimal is there some regulatory compliance there within banking which maybe other industries don't see the, that require a, a physical you know as you said four eyes compliance process maybe okay. I mean, all the changes at all time, you should be able to trace back. So if, let's say right now, we have an um, issue in our platform, some customer somehow cannot see their balance, cannot see their portfolio, or the money they wire to another, then they bought something, they cannot see it's showing up. This is a much bigger name. Then someone say, okay, I'm, I purchased this thing from Amazon and it didn't ship. 
it's much because you don't really know how much net stock could worth tomorrow or at this particular moment. Yep. So it could easily get into lawsuit if you cannot prove that all changes is legitimate. Okay. You have your someone in the in the company with the right knowledge of proving the change going out. And it was an honest mistake due to whatever reason, if it was a mistake. Yep. But in the entire process, you need to be able to document who did what change at what time, approved by who. Yep. Yep. Good. Um, a few more coming in. Uh, I'll take a few more. Uh, doesn't shifting security left add more cognitive load for the developers? If you don't do it right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you need to give them template. You cannot just say, hey, you cannot run as root. And then they probably ask you back, say, so what can I run as? What, what am I run as right now? Right? But instead, if you give them a helm chart, say, hey, your helm chart just based on this one, I'll just copy this section in. That's the least that you can do. Right? Say, so, okay, you probably need to run as a user. This is how you create a user. That's how you use a user. If you give them instruction, it's much easier. Do it with them if they really need help. But don't just say, we have this new rule. Now you have to be compliant with it. Then nobody's going to work with you, right? Yeah, I think, again, automating and you know, proper documentation exactly. helps with shifting uh, exactly. security exactly. left. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I'll take a few more, as we do have time. What is your process to deal with vulnerabilities uh, detected in production? Um, that's a very good question. So we also been through this process of in the beginning, we just show it to developers. It's a warning. And you know how developers deal with a the warning. They don't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it it goes through, right? And then we start doing, of course, like a um, webinar to teach and develop about it uh, long before we need to enforce it. So yes, and then you need to get, the, if you cannot fix right away, you need to get a security exception. Going through the system, apply for security exception right now. When, when will you fix it? And what's the reason why you cannot fix it right now? So you need to, you have to fix it. And this is... Yeah, how we stay compliant. We need to fix on the vulnerability, on the critical vulnerability we found in the system. Uh, I don't know if I put yeah, the, something uh, about uh, how often I'll, do you I'll release. Yeah. Uh, how often do you release? I'll get it back. Yep. So it's how often do you release? Do you follow a fixed schedule or can you release anytime? Most team. I would say 98% of team in the company can release any time. However, if you are the one, okay, we have a very critical service called streaming. This is where on the stream on the price feed to our customer, and you don't want to update that, that feed when the market opening. That's the only thing that it's when we are a little bit sensitive about. So you can probably wait a little bit after the market open. Otherwise, it's fire as well. Yeah. Because as long as you go through the gates, you are safe to release. And we trust our developers. Yeah, and again, uh, the whole automating process uh, exactly. ensures that you can exactly. release whenever you want, even if it's a Friday. We uh, even encourage people to, to, to release at working hour because we, we try to try really hard in the past couple of years to move people away from release in weekend or after work hours because you don't have as many people in office at that time. And you all know, despite what we talk about now, everyone to build a distributed system, everyone to have your mon uh, little application, not this monolith, but you still depend on other, other teams' service. If someone releases something, breaks something else, or they have a new version coming out and you are not at there to, to, to find out, it, it could be very difficult to bring the entire platform up because of those dependencies. So it's best that you do it at work hour. Everybody is there to help you, if there's anything. Good to know. Um, I'll take the last one. So how do you handle law requirements in development and security in faster team processes and deployments? I think we are pretty lucky in that way. It doesn't change as rapid. And in, in the market, we have this election every four years, they change the office. And that's always a chaos in the town when they change in the office. And also on the tax system, I think they have a much bigger problem than us, or in terms of law, or this new regulation enforcement. But for us, I don't see us having that challenge yet. Say, oh, this regulation just came out. But it's more an audit part, say, now how many years back up with we should have 
and immediately we need to go to check all our backups, say how, how old they are. Or if they say due to the new GRPC, uh, no, GDPR, yeah, GDPR law, we, certain things we cannot stop in certain time. Or we need to prove we can back up in how long time period, and then we need to work on that. But for our applications, I haven't seen the, the challenge yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's time for us. We do have more questions, but uh, unfortunately, that's the amount of time we have left. But Chen Hong's going to be around. here around, yeah. uh, so do catch her if you have any questions. Uh, and again, finally, one round of applause for Thank Chen you. Hong. Thank you. Thank you.